This is Steve with Rocky Mountain ATV MC, and this is Carburetor 101. A lot of people get intimidated by carburetors, so today I'm going to walk you through some carburetor types, the basic functions, and how the internal parts work. We will also cover some commonly asked questions about carburetors, whether you're making changes to it, or if you're having a running issue with your engine. First, we need to understand the fundamental basics of a carburetor, the different carburetor types, and how the internal parts work. A carburetor essentially controls the fuel and air entering a motor by adding more, speeding the engine up, or taking away and causing the engine to idle down. Now, it does this using the Venturi Principle. Now, the Venturi Principle is essentially a large diameter tube that gradually reduced to a smaller diameter tube. Now, as air flows through it, the air will speed up once it hits this restriction. There is tiny passages that will allow fuel to flow into the carburetor bore. Now because of this high speed air traveling past it, it will suck that fuel out of the carburetor into the bore, causing it to atomize, giving it an accurate mixture of air and fuel so that internal combustion can work. Now there's an ideal fuel-air mixture that a carburetor needs to maintain and adjust based on load and engine speed. So we're going to break that down so that you get a better understanding on how that works. Now there's three basic type of carburetors, but there's a, a thousand variations of each type of carburetor used in the power sports industry. So the first carburetor is the fixed Venturi type. Now you'll see these on like lawnmowers or generators or power equipment, but it, what its ideal purpose is is to maintain a certain RPM throughout the uh, running of the engine. Now the second one is the mechanical slide carburetor. Now this is really common carburetor on motorcycles and ATVs and uh, small bikes and even performance bikes. Um, I have two different variations of a mechanical slide here uh, and that's because one's based more for four strokes and the other is two strokes. They work very much the same but slightly different. Now the third type is a constant velocity carburetor. There's two variations, there's a two jet and a three jet constant velocity or more known as a CV carburetor. Now these are the most common carburetors in the power sports industry. They're used on ATVs, UTVs, dual sport bikes, adventure bikes, sport bikes, cruisers. I mean, it's the most common carburetor out there. Now the reason for that is because it will only deliver fuel and air mixture into the engine when, it ne when the engine needs it and only when the engine needs it. Now the difference between a CV carburetor and a mechanical carburetor is on a mechanical you're forcing the slide open allowing air into the engine. Now on a CV the engine is using vacuum to open the slide to allow uh, fuel and air into the engine. The function is basically the same between all three different types of carburetors. So we're going to talk about the three circuits that each carburetor uses, the parts within that circuit and how they work. Now first let's talk about the low speed circuit, also known as the idle circuit or the pilot circuit. Now in this circuit you have a jet. Now if you don't know what a jet is, a jet is a, usually a brass fitting with a small hole inside of it that will allow fuel to flow through it. Now on the side of the jet there will be a stamp number and this will reference the size of that hole. Now if you have a bigger number it's usually a bigger hole and that would mean it would allow more, flow, or more fuel to flow through and a smaller number would mean a smaller hole allowing less fuel to flow through. So essentially when you hear somebody, I need to rejet my carburetor, they're essentially changing these jets out so that they can get the correct amount of fuel that the engine needs to run correctly. Now in the low speed circuit we have a pilot jet and it's susceptible to clogging because it's a small passage so if you're having issues with that circuit that's a good candidate to want to clean or replace. And it needs to work in conjunction with a, either an air screw or a fuel screw like on this particular carburetor, this would be the fuel screw, which essentially you can adjust it clockwise in or counterclockwise out, and the fine tip needle on that closes off a passageway or opens a passageway, allowing either more fuel or air, in this case fuel. Now like on this carburetor, it controls air, so you're allowing either more air or less air by turning it clockwise or counterclockwise. Now this is very useful on a carburetor because you can fine tune that circuit when you're tuning the engine. Now with, with the pilot circuit, because of the small passages and the, the fact that it can get gummed up or get clogged very easily, if you're having running issues with that circuit, those are the first two things that I would check to either clean or replace. Now to clarify the difference between a fuel screw and an air screw, an air screw is generally located on the air boot side of the carburetor and on a fuel screw, like on this FCR carb, 
it would be on the engine side of the carburetor. Like for instance, this is where your fuel screw would go. Now the other thing is, is most fuel screws are accessible. Some have a tamper proof plug over them so that you can't even see that it's there. And to adjust that or remove it, you have to actually drill that out. Um, I would highly suggest following your owner's manual specifically on that uh, before you do that. The other thing is, is these can be very hard to access. Um, like we've come out with this Tusk fuel screw that they actually work really, really well as they hang down far enough so that you can actually get to it while it's in the bike and it's easy to adjust. So you can see here with this stock fuel screw, you have to use a flat blade screwdriver and when it's mounted in the bike, it can be very hard to get to. There's a couple special tools you could buy that basically come in at an angle so that you can adjust it. But it's something you definitely need to adjust um, when you're tuning your carburetor. And that's like if you change, you know, 4,000 feet in elevation, that's something you will we'll, we'll have to tweak on. Otherwise, your bike's not going to run as good as it could run. Now, the last thing to remember about the pilot circuit is it will continue to flow as you apply throttle and transition into the mid-range circuit and so forth into the main circuit. So if the pilot circuit isn't flowing correctly, your mid-range circuit will be off and your main circuit will be off. So they need to work all together and all flow together for your engine to work correctly. Moving on to the mid-range circuit, now this is where one quarter to three quarter throttle would apply and where most of the time spent uh, with engine operation is in the mid-range circuit. So I've got three different examples right here just to show you there's a lot of variation in the, in the functioning parts. So this is where the slide, jet needle, and needle jet come into play. Now on a CV carburetor, you're gonna use a rubber diaphragm which uses engine vacuum to uh, suck the slide up and allow more air to enter the fuel. On a mechanical slide like these two uh, is obviously mechanical. You use a cable or a different type of operation to to open that slide and allow uh, air into the engine. Now I've got a jet needle and a needle seat here off of this FCR carburetor that I'll show you as an example. So jet needles are tapered and as you put it into the needle seat when it's completely closed, when your throttle's all the way closed, it's running off your pilot circuit, so essentially it's not even allowing any fuel up through it. Now, as you transition into the mid-range circuit, the needle gets raised, and because of that taper, the higher you go, the, more, uh, the less restriction you have and the more fuel will flow. So once you get to wide open throttle, eventually this isn't going to do anything and you'll be running completely off of just the main jet, and that would be from three-quarter throttle to, to full throttle. Now the, the other thing about needles that you need to know is that most of them have a clip position or per se. You can adjust these and this is part of tuning especially when you change elevation, where you're going to ride it and that sort. So if you were to lower the clip to the bottom, that's going to raise the needle allowing more fuel to flow and vice versa. If you were to raise the clip to the top, the needle will sit lower into this needle seat and allow less fuel to flow. Now, if you want more information about that, we have a video about adjusting your jet needle. Now, the last thing I want to point out about the mid-range circuit is this needle seat, and they're also called a nozzle or an emulsion tube. If they do have tiny holes on the side of it, you need to make sure to get those cleaned out or just go ahead and replace it. It's a pretty important part uh, of the function of the mid-range circuit. Moving on to your main circuit. Now, this is where your three-quarter throttle to wide open throttle or your pin it to win it circuit would apply. Now the functioning part is basically the main jet. Now on, on three jet CV carburetors, they will have two main jets, but all other carburetors will have one. Now the main jet are mounted to the needle seat. Now they work in conjunction in the fashion that the main jet will, will supply the jet needle with fuel. Now, but the needle is doing the restriction. So as you apply your throttle, your needle will eventually have no more restriction for your fuel and all of the restriction will be done solely by the main jet. Because the main jet supplies the needle with fuel, if your main jet is clogged up, your mid-range and main circuit won't work correctly. So if you have a machine that idles fine but dies when you give it throttle, chances are the main jet is clogged up. So that's essentially how that works. Now if you're, it, a lot of carburetors will have a splash guard which is essentially just a, a guard that keeps fuel from sloshing around so that you don't possibly suck air or something like that and, and give you a better uh, running condition. Now, main jets are obviously interchangeable, so if you end up rejetting your carburetor, 
there's stamp number, numbers on it as well and you'll most likely end up changing out your main jet when you rejet your carburetor. Now let's talk about supplementary circuits. Now the most commonly used supp supplementary circuit is the choke system or enrichment system. Now what that is, is it's allowing fuel into the motor when the engine's cold to help make it start much easier. Now there's a number of different ways that this is done, like for instance on a fixed Venturi, you will have a choke plate, which basically you close that, not allowing any air to pass through the carburetor at all, and because as you crank the motor it will help suck fuel out of the carburetor and create that condition, making it much easier to start. Now another type that you'll run into is a plunger style. Now you'll see these mostly on mechanical flat side carburetors, which essentially is uh, a lever or a plunger that you pull out opening a passageway that allows fuel or fuel and air into the motor to create that condition. Now this particular uh, choke you'll find more so on two-stroke carburetors as it, as it serves two purposes. One, the choke, and two, as an idle. So instead of having an idle screw on the side of your uh, carburetor, this will serve as the idle. So you would turn it clockwise or counterclockwise to adjust that. So it's kind of nice, it works pretty good. Now another type that you'll run into is a plunger style or a primer style, which is essentially um, before you crank it over, you'd go ahead and push this a few times, which would force fuel, raw fuel into the engine, creating that rich condition to help start easier. Now one of the last common ones that you'll run into is a servo style, which essentially it's opened a passageway to allow fuel through done electronically. So once the engine starts and warms up, it will automatically shut that circuit off, creating the correct uh, fuel air ratio that the engine needs to run. So the next supplementary circuit I want to talk to you about and which mostly you only see on your high performance four stroke carburetors is the hot start. Now because high performance motors run hotter, the fuel in the carburetor will atomize sooner once the motor's hot. So if you're sitting there riding along and you kill it, it will actually create a rich condition. So to correct this, some of the manufacturers have created a hot start, which is essentially a plunger that can be operated by a lever like this or a cable operated one that's up on your handlebar but essentially it opens a passageway allowing air only to correct that rich condition so that it's easier to start. Now the last circuit that I want to talk about is the accelerator pump. Now you'll see these more commonly on your four-stroke carburetors again. You may see them on some two-stroke, but for the most part your four-stroke mechanical flat slide carburetors. Now because you can mechanically force the slide open and introduce air to the motor immediately, to correct that it needs fuel immediately. So they've done that by using a diaphragm and a small passageway through the carburetor for fuel so that as you apply the throttle, it will push on the diaphragm, forcing raw fuel directly right into your engine. Now you might run into this with a bog where you crack the throttle and, and the engine just doesn't pick up, it falls right on its face. Now most of the time, this is the very reason why it's done that and it needs to be corrected. So there's a number of different ways that you can do that. A lot of times there's a jet in, in that circuit that you can change out. There is also a nozzle in the circuit that sprays fuel directly down the bore of the carburetor. This nozzle also has a tiny passage that can get clogged up as well. There's some aftermarket companies that have made this very simple, and very easy to do, which is essentially you replace a part on your carburetor that has a number of different fixed holes or a screw that you can adjust like on these Boysen ones. Um, R&Ds come out with a version that works similar which is a quick adjust screw and that's really convenient and nice so that you don't have to take the float bowl or the carburetor part to make those adjustments. You can just do it on the fly. So that's something that you'll definitely want to look into if you're having any sort of bogging issues. Now the last thing I want to point out with the choke circuit is that if you have a plunger style that's operated with the cable, what happens is, is you get water corrosion in there and the plunger gets stuck in the passageway. Now if this happens you're definitely going to want to get it out and replace it. But a quick tip on how to avoid that is if you pull it out and you apply a little grease uh, inside of it, that will help keep it working smoothly. And obviously if you lube your cables often, that will help aid in that problem and avoid it altogether. So just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about the float valve system. Now the float valve system is essentially an on-off valve to control fuel entering your carburetor. How that works is as fuel is filling up in the float bowl, the float will float in it and in turn shut off the fuel supply with a, with a valve. 
So the working parts in it are a float, a pivot pin, an actual float valve, and a, and a float seat. Now they come in a number of different sizes and shapes. Um, some have uh, filter screens on them. Some have little retaining clips. Um, some are rubber tipped. Some are, are metal tipped. Um, some of them you press into the carburetor body. Some of them you screw in. But they all serve the same function. Now if the float's open, you know, hanging down, it will allow fuel to enter in. And as it fills up, it will shut off the needle into the seat and shut off the fuel. Now, this float needs to maintain a certain level, and that's, it's very crucial as that's its single most important job. So over here on this electron carburetor, I've, I've got it illustrated so that you can see it, where this level needs to maintain a certain level. Now, if your float is out of adjustment, if it's too high and the fuel level is too high, that will cause a rich condition throughout all the circuits. And then vice versa, if the float level is too low, it will create a lean condition throughout all of the circuits. So it's something you definitely want to check anytime you get into a carburetor. Now to adjust that level, you can measure it. There's a couple tools out there like this one where you can essentially stick it up to the float and move this little arm and that will give you the measurement. Others, you can use a tube off the bottom of the carburetor and it has some lines that you can refer to um, and you fill it with fuel and measure it that way. <clears throat> now how to adjust it is most, of a, most floats have a little metal tang on there that the float valve itself attaches to or rests on. Now you can bend that up or down and that's how you adjust it. So it may take you a few times to get it just accurate, but it's pretty easy to do. Now some of them are just non-adjustable like this plastic one. It, if you have a failure here, you just need to replace it. Now the reason I stress about the float system so much is it's usually one of the first things that fail. It'll either not be able to shut off the fuel and it'll leak out of the overflow on the carburetor or it'll even leak right into the motor and fill your crankcase up with fuel. Either way, it's no good. And that's the cause right there is this float valve itself. Now, one of the biggest things that people miss is they'll replace just the float valve itself, but they won't do the seat. Now, on some carburetors, you can't replace it like on this one. It's pressed in there. You just, you can't, you just have to replace the whole thing, which it kind of sucks, but it's always better if you're able to. So like on this one, it has an O-ring and that O-ring will go bad a lot. Well, if a guy replaces just this, that's only gonna seal the inside of it and not the outside of it. So they'll put it all together and it'll still leak and they get stumped. So anytime you can replace the whole assembly, it's always the best way to go. Now the last thing I wanna talk about is the float pivoting pin. Now most of them are a free floating one like this one where it just floats there, you can remove it uh, either way to re remove the float from the actual cast or the body of the carburetor. There are quite a few out there that are a slightly press fit, which is you put it in and you have to kind of press it in and it stays there stationary and then the float just pivots on that. There's a number of other items that you could potentially run into on carburetors, like this TPS sensor. There's a lot of carburetors out there that have them. That just tells the ECU on the bike or machine that you're on where your throttle position is actually at. Always pay attention to like your hoses and, and any, any fitting that push or fits inside the cast of the carburetor. Um, you could run into air cutoff valves. Um, it, it's always, always make sure that your idle adjustment screw is, works freely. And if basically anything on a carburetor that's rubber, if it has a tear, nick, crease in it, chances are it's gonna give you problems or it's already given you problems. So just go ahead and replace those. Now we're gonna cover some commonly asked questions about carburetors. My first question would be, do I need to reject my machine? Well, there's a number of factors that you, need, that you need to consider when doing that, like altitude, humidity, temperature, riding conditions, and if you've recently modified your machine. Now jetting doesn't change overnight, so if you do have a sudden change in the way that your bike runs, chances are something's clogged up in your carburetor, or you could potentially have a, another problem going on with your machine. So don't just go ahead and start changing your jets out thinking that it's going to fix the problem that you're having. We recommend thoroughly going through your carburetor and making sure all the passages are clean, clear, and working properly. Now if you need help with that, we have a really good video on how to clean your carburetor. We offer a number of different aftermarket carburetor rebuild kits so that when you're going through your carburetor to make sure that it's clean, clear, and working correctly, that definitely will help you out. 
Now, if you do need to rejet your carburetor, we offer a number of aftermarket kits for that as well, with detailed instructions on how to rejet your carburetor. Now, the last thing is you can go look at our OEM parts finder. Now, you can go in there and look at a specific diagram for your carburetor on your machine, and you can see all the individual parts, so that if you just need to replace one part, you can do that. Now, my next question is, how do you know if your machine is rich or lean? Well, a quick way to tell is if you pull your spark plug out and take a look at that. If it's black, dark, or sooty, that would, be, that would be a rich condition. If it's white, really dry, that would be a lean condition. Now, other ways you can tell is if it surges, if it bogs, or has a really hard time idling, that's generally a rich condition. On the other side, if, it, if you get a hanging idle, meaning it wants to idle a lot higher than it's supposed to, or you get backfiring, those are indicators of it running lean. But ultimately, what you'd want to do is go look at your OEM service manual in the carburetor section for the specific specs of it. Now that'll give you an indicator of what jetting is in your carburetor, or you could just pull it apart and look and see exactly where it's at. Now you could also make incremental changes to that to see if your bike starts to run better. Now keep in mind, anytime you go lean, you have the potential of locking up or seizing a motor, especially if it's a two-stroke, so just be aware of that. Now my next question is, if your machine won't start or it has a hard time starting, now, the most common issue is in the low-speed circuit, your pilot jet or your fuel screw or air screw is dirty or, or clogged. So I would go there first and make sure that they're clean and clear and working correctly. Hopefully that will solve your problem. Now, my last question is, is if your carburetor is leaking fuel. Now, there's really two issues that you need to look at. Obviously, there's gaskets that seal the carburetor together, then you could check those first. The other thing you check is your float valve. Now that's the most common issue with carburetors is the float valve fails. Now first I would go through and make sure it was clean and clear and working correctly. I mean a lot of times debris would just get it hung up and so it won't close the valve off all the way. So if you do that first it may seal it up. But if it doesn't seal it up you'll probably want to go ahead and replace the float valve. Now hopefully you have a better understanding of carburetors, the basic functions and the parts within. So come check us out at RockyMountainATVMC.com for all of your carburetor needs. Now remember, all orders over $75 ship for free, and if you have a question, please comment below. But you need to make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is Steve, we'll catch you next time.